Hello everyone. Welcome back to class. I hope you all had a wonderful weekend and that you're ready to jump back in to biomedical ethics. So this week we're actually going to be turning our attention to the principles that biomedical ethics is based upon. Last time, last week that is, the last two modules, we've been looking at the different ethical theories that underlie the practice of healthcare. We've looked at virtue theory, natural law theory, deontology, utilitarianism, liberal individualism, communitarianism, ethics of care, and casuistry. All of these different ethical theories were providing different formulations as to what makes an action moral or immoral. Similarly, they disagreed on which values we should follow and live out which ones are best to consider in human life, and what the primary aim of human action and life should be. For Kant, happiness should be subordinated to living a moral life. For Aquinas, the spiritual life or spiritual fulfillment should take priority over earthly concerns. For liberal individualism, the protection of individual rights should take priority over concerns having to do with wider society, such as public health, whereas communitarianism kind of took the opposite stance. You should interpret all of these ethical theories as basically being different frameworks with which to judge whether an action is moral or immoral, different frameworks that you can use to determine what you should do, and what kind of treatment, perhaps, uh, a patient should undergo in a clinical setting. So I want you to interpret what we've been doing for the last two modules is investigating a bunch of different frameworks. I'm providing you with different tools that you can use in your clinical experience. In general, then, we could say, when we're engaged in medical practice, when we're thinking about it, what these theories present to us is that we should consider many factors, like the impacts of our actions, the motivations or the intentions that drive human action, the goal or ends of our actions, what are we trying to get out of it, the protection of individual rights, social well-being, and to the history of cases and medical practice. Is there any history that we can rely upon to help make some of these decisions in the present and in the future? We can say that biomedical ethics is based on all of these different theories to greater and lesser degrees. What we're going to be talking about this week, though, are the four principles that pretty much all Western biomedical ethics is based upon. These principles are invoked to guide and justify practice. In this lecture, we'll be looking at the first two that are mentioned in Chapter 2 of Medical Ethics in Humanities, Autonomy and Non-Maleficence. Later this week, we'll look at the other two, which are Justice and beneficence. Before I get to talking about these first two principles, let me just talk about principles in general and their relation to biomedical ethics. We say that ethics in general and bioethics in particular is based on certain principles. But what is a principle? Well, the authors of this chapter define it as follows. A principle is a basic truth or a general law or doctrine that is used as a basis of reasoning or a guide to action or behavior. What principles do is they often seek to encapsulate moral theories for us. And we use principles to guide moral judgments and our moral decision making. So whenever we try to justify a moral action or try to figure it out, figure out what it is that we ought to do in a certain ethical situation. 
what we found is that we can helpfully summarize the important parts of these ethical theories in these kind of airtight principles that we express to one another. These principles serve as a good way of expressing to others why it is we think something should be done and why it should be done that way. So justifying the decision or the judgment to other people and expressing that to others. The authors in this chapter note that the principles that underlie biomedical ethics today have been outlined historically in the Belmont Report, a report which sought to identify and express the ethical guidelines that people should use and rely on for human research. They list three different principles in this report. The first one is respect for persons. The report notes that when we engage in human research, we should respect people's autonomy and protect those with diminished autonomy. So the idea is something like this. If we're going to use humans in a trial, or if we're going to use humans for psychological or medical research, first of all, we should respect the decisions that they make within this context. We shouldn't try to coerce or manipulate them into doing something that they don't want to do. And we have to pay special attention to those who do not have the ability to make decisions for themselves. For example, those who are in a coma or vegetative state, or those who are children who don't have finely tuned rational capacities. Respect for persons means allowing people to freely make decisions, not forcing them in a particular situation, and making decisions on behalf of those who cannot make decisions for themselves. The second principle the report outlines is beneficence. Sorry, my cat is meowing in the background here. Beneficence involves basically two different things. The first means we try not to do harm to individuals, and the second involves looking out for people's well-being. The first is what is invoked in the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. The idea is very simple. When we're engaging in the practice of healthcare, when we're engaging in research, we should not try to do harm to the patients or the participants. We should try to prevent any harm that might come from them from any of the interventions that we want to employ. But more so than this, we don't just want to prevent harm if we can, we also want to try to maximize the benefits and minimize the harms if patients do have to experience some harms. In other words, if we're engaged in medical research, we want to try to get the, the maximize the benefits that we can from that research so that it can help the most amount of people in the most effective way possible. And we want to try to conduct and design experiments that don't involve much pain or suffering, if we can manage it. The report outlines one more principle that should guide research moving forward, and that is justice. The authors of the report basically define justice as the proper administration of the costs and benefits of research and practice, or what we might call fair distribution of the costs and benefits of research. The report notes that there have been several different experiments that have been run throughout history and Western society that have not fairly distributed the costs and benefits of research. Here's a quote from the report. Until recently, questions of justice have not generally been associated with scientific research. However, they are foreshadowed even in the earliest reflections on the ethics of research involving human subjects. 
For example, during the 19th and early 20th centuries, the burdens of serving as research subjects fell largely upon poor ward patients, while the benefits of improved medical care flowed primarily to private patients. Subsequently, the exploitation of unwilling prisoners as research subjects in Nazi concentration camps was condemned as a particularly flagrant injustice. In this country, in the 1940s, the Tuskegee syphilis study used disadvantaged rural black men to study the untreated course of a disease that is by no means confined to that population. These subjects were deprived of demonstrably effective treatment in order not to interrupt the project, long after such treatment became generally available. So, what the report outlines is that if we are engaged in scientific research involving human participants, we need to try to make it so that not only do we not harm the participants, but we try to do the research to produce some benefits and we properly distribute the benefits and the costs of the experimentation so that it doesn't fall just on one group, one racial group, gendered group, social group, age group, and so that the benefits of that research uh, becomes available to everybody. These principles would then go on to inform one of the seminal classic texts of biomedical ethics. They were expanded upon Beauchamp and Childress's Principles of Biomedical Ethics, which we've been actually looking at in this class. And today, biomedical practice and decision-making is based on this four principles approach that they talk about in this book. So for the remainder of this lecture, I'd like to talk about just the first two principles that basically underlie all medical practice today. They are respect for autonomy and non-maleficence. And I will take them in turn. First, when we engage in healthcare practice, we want to make sure that we are respecting patient autonomy and respecting the autonomy of the care team, the surgeons, and the other people in these settings. Respect for autonomy is supposed to express that we have some sort of duty to respect people's self-governance, to respect people's decisions and desires and interests. The authors of this chapter note that this respect for autonomy confers two obligations on healthcare practitioners, a negative obligation and a positive obligation. The negative obligation is that autonomous actions should not be subjected to the controlling constraints of others. Basically in healthcare settings, what that means is people should be allowed to make their own decisions. We should not try to coerce or manipulate people into accepting a certain treatment or going along with a certain decision. Provided that they are competent, that they can understand the consequences, the risks and the benefits of the potential treatment, they should be allowed to largely make the decision that they wanna make and that that should be respected. This also confers a positive obligation on practitioners. We can describe that obligation as follows. People uh, should be given proper information and an arena in which they can engage in autonomous decision making. So there are two parts to this. The first is that Patients, for example, are properly informed about the risks, the benefits, and alternative treatment options that they face. So we're not hiding any information that is material to the patient. We're telling them how it is. We're giving them the big picture. And similarly, that some sort of arena is provided in which individuals are free to engage 
think through their different options, and make the decision that they want to make. That is, we need to refrain from constructing a situation in which somebody feels coerced or manipulated or pressured into a certain decision. We ought to respect their freedom of thought and their freedom to come to the conclusion that they come to. To make this a little bit more practical, respecting autonomy means that healthcare providers should tell the truth, respect others' privacy, protect others' confidential information, obtain consent from patients for interventions, and, if they are asked, help others make important decisions. To sum it all up, we could say, in medicine, in clinical settings, we don't want to dep deprive patients of freedom. We want to tell it to them like it is, give them all the necessary information to make an informed choice, respect their privacy so we don't share uh, things said in confidence willy-nilly. We want to make sure that we obtain consent from patients before we give them any treatments or surgeries or other interventions, and we want to help them make a decision if they're having trouble understanding something or if they ask for help. The authors say that an autonomous choice is one which has a few different characteristics. It has to be voluntary, that is, free from controlling constraints. It needs to be based on informed consent and it needs to be uh, the person needs to have competency or decision-making capacity. All of these are required in order for a patient's decision or choice to be autonomous. Let me just break it down a little bit further. What this means is, as we've said before, the patient isn't coerced or manipulated into a particular decision. They've been allowed to think through the decision on their own terms, whether or not they want a certain treatment or certain intervention. They're not pressured into one. They're not blackmailed. There's no gun being held up against their head. They're allowed to freely think through this. The patient is also given information that tells them the risks of the treatment or intervention its benefits, and any alternatives, as well as the health care provider's recommendation for what they should do. Thus, we want to make sure that we're not hiding anything that would influence a patient's decision from them. This involves the status, perhaps, of their ailment, again, the risks and benefits of any treatment options, if there are any alternative treatment options available, etc. We want to make sure that patients have the full necessary picture in order to make an informed choice. To put it in another way, an autonomous choice is one in which the patient understands the situation at hand, they understand the consequences of their decision, and the decision is generally based on rational reasons. So we want to make sure that before a patient undergoes any intervention, they understand what they're getting into, they understand why this is being done, how it's being done, they understand what's going to happen as a, or what could happen as a result of this intervention, and they've actually thought it through. It's not based on arbitrary or capricious reasons. For example, I'm going to go with the, uh, through with the treatment if the next person who walks past my door is wearing a blue jacket. That would not be a, a proper reason. Some of the issues and complications determining whether or not somebody has autonomy is detailed in case 2A on page 49 in this chapter. 
and I'm going to go through that here. Case 2A. Imagine the following scenario. An 86-year-old female is informed that her leg is gangrenous and that an amputation is necessary to save her life. She refuses surgery, saying, I am 86 and I have lived a good and full life. I do not want a further operation, nor do I want to live legless. I understand the consequence of refusing the amputation is death, and I accept that consequence. We might ask in this situation, is this patient competent to decide to refuse the surgery? Here's what the analysis says. The issue in this case is the patient's competency or decisional capacity. Does the patient understand her situation? That is, that she has life-threatening gangrene? Yes. Does she understand the consequences of her decision? That she will die without surgery? Yes. Is her decision based on rational reasons? Most of us would probably conclude that the reasons for the refusal are rational under the situation. That having to undergo unwanted further surgery and having to live legless at the age of 86 might reasonably be a judge to be a greater harm than death to an 86-year-old who has lived a full life. Thus, it seems her refusal should be honored. If the patient refused the surgery, though, insisting that she did not have gangrene, we could argue that she was incompetent because she lacked an understanding of her situation. If instead, while conceding that she had gangrene, she nevertheless refused surgery, insisting that the gangrene would be cured of a course of antibiotics, we could argue here that she was incompetent because she lacked an understanding of the consequences of her decision. If she were to say, quote, I understand the situation and the consequences, but I refuse the operation because the moon is full, it is not likely she would be considered competent. Her decision does not rationally or reasonably follow from her premise, and she in this situation would probably be labeled incompetent. So, in healthcare settings, we want to make sure that we are respecting the autonomy of individuals giving them all the information that would pertain to making an informed decision, allowing them to think through and make that decision themselves, not coercing them into anything, and that this decision should be honored if we can determine that they have decision-making capacity. Of course, it's not so cut and dry as this. We all know that really difficult cases come up in these healthcare settings. In the hospital, in hospice, crazy situations happen that are complicated, that are complex. And if we're not religiously inclined, we might think that basing one's decisions on religious reasons are not rational, and therefore that these people don't have competency. That is, treatment may become complicated when respect for autonomy and one's religious beliefs are considered. This is discussed in case 2b on page 51 and 52. Let's go over that one. A 58-year-old woman with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, had over a period of years repeatedly expressed a desire not to be endotracheally in intubated and mechanically ventilated, quote, unless such an intervention were to be purely temporary. The patient was brought to the hospital in terminal respiratory failure, and it was the opinion of the medical staff, including a consulting pulmonologist, that if she were placed on a ventilator, there was almost no chance of her ever being weaned. When her physician asked her whether she wanted to be intubated, she expressed a wish to be placed on a ventilator, quote, even if she would never again be able to be weaned from it, unquote. The physicians caring for her decided that her request to be intubated did not represent an autonomous choice because it was made under the, quote, internal coercion of panic, fear, anoxia, and hypercarbia, and because it was entirely inconsistent with her repeatedly and emphatically stated prior wishes. 
The patient was sedated and allowed to die. We might ask, do we agree with the decision not to intubate her? Well, here's what the analysis has to say. As mentioned previously, this case can be analyzed on a number of levels. But because the chapter deals with principles of biomedical ethics, that's how we're going to look at this case. The question to be answered is whether the patient should have been intubated. To answer that question, the first issue that needs to be addressed is whether this patient's deathbed consent to intubation was autonomous. Let's assume that the patient's choice to refuse even life-sustaining treatment, if autonomous, should be respected. Recall that a choice is autonomous if it is voluntary, informed, and made by an agent with decisional capacity. In this case, it is the decisional capacity or competency of the patient and the voluntariness of her choice that are in question. Thus, there are two questions that must be answered. One, did she have decisional capacity? And two, was her choice voluntary? First, did she have decisional capacity? Recall that a patient is competent if, one, she has an understanding of the situation and the consequences of her decision, and two, her decision is based on rational reasons. We are told that she was, quote, slightly fuzzy, albeit grossly oriented, and that physicians responsible for her care were concerned about her anoxia and hypercarbia. Regarding her anoxia, was she anoxic and or hypercarbic enough to be rendered incompetent? We simply do not seem to have enough information to be able to answer this question. Luckily, under the law, there is a rebuttal presumption that patients are competent. That is, the burden of persuasion rests with those who would argue that a person lacks decisional capacity or competency. Because of this presumption, we would argue that absent probative evidence to the contrary, the patient was competent to consent to intubation and mechanical ventilation. Second, was her choice to refuse mechanical ventilation voluntary? As stated earlier, quote, a person acts voluntarily to the degree that he or she wills the action without being under the control of another's influence, unquote. Clearly, this patient was not under the control of any other person's influence. Beauchamp and Childress state, however, that conditions such as debilitating disease, among others, can diminish or void voluntariness. In this case, the physicians responsible for her care expressed concern regarding the, quote, internal coercion of panic and fear, unquote. Were the patient's panic and fear great enough to avoid voluntariness? We would argue that the same policy considerations that undergird the presumption of competency should undergird a presumption of voluntariness. Who is to say that, faced with the real and immediate specter of one's death, one does not possess a certain insight or clarity lacking in the rest of us? Why should we believe that fear of death precludes the ability to choose autonomously? We believe that her later choice to consent to intubation and mechanical ventilation should have been honored and that she should have been intubated. So here the authors are arguing that she was competent, so she could make a decision that should be honored and that her choice to uh, refuse ventilation Or uh, if it was uh, not voluntary before, perhaps it is voluntary now. So her later wish should have been respected. These cases are really difficult, right? I'm sure a lot of you in your own careers have faced difficult decisions like this. It's not going to be easy, and you're going to come up against even more difficult decisions in the future. The main point that I want to impress upon you all is this. When you are making these decisions, when you are contributing to caring for an individual in a healthcare setting, 
What we want to do is respect patient autonomy. This is not something that all countries and healthcare systems share. For example, in some Eastern countries, individual autonomy is not as highly respected as it is in the US, but this is a principle that strongly underlies biomedical ethics in the United States. So that's the first principle. The second principle I want to discuss, which is fairly simple and straightforward, is non-maleficence. Non-maleficence means we have a duty to refrain from causing harm, which is defined by adverse effect on one's interests. So it's important that this principle says we have a duty to refrain causing harm. Because harm is not exactly the same as physical pain. You can punch me and I'll feel physical pain. And insofar as I didn't want to be punched, you've harmed me because you've done something against my interests. But there are other things that can happen to people that are adverse to their interests that don't necessarily involve physical pain. For example, let's say you are married and your husband cheats on you. I think we could argue that even if you never found out that he did that, you were still harmed by that action, even if it didn't cause you any physical pain. So within healthcare settings, when we're trying to refrain from causing a patient harm, we're trying to refrain from doing things adverse to their interests, their desires, what would be good for them. All of these things are going to be wrapped up in how we should treat them, the kinds of things that we should refrain from doing to them. To be a little bit more practical, non-maleficence means that healthcare providers should not kill their patients, cause them pain or suffering, incapacitate them, cause them offense unnecessarily, or deprive them of the goods of life. So these are all related to promoting one's interests, or at least refraining from causing someone harm. But there are situations in which causing harm is actually justifiable. In general, we don't want to bring harm to people, but there might be situations in which causing someone harm is outweighed by the benefits. One of the examples the text brings up is saving one's life through a blood transfusion while it does harm them in the moment by because it involves stabbing the person with a needle, let's say, and might cause them a little bit of pain or discomfort, this harm is justifiable because it's a life-saving treatment and it doesn't cause them an immense amount of pain or suffering. So this is an important caveat that we're going to really have to consider in these different circumstances. We want to refrain from causing harm, but there are situations in which causing harm is justifiable. This idea is often associated with what is known as the doctrine or rule of double effect. And this is also discussed in this chapter, in case 2C, which I'm going to go over with you now. A patient with a long smoking history is hospitalized with advanced COPD and lung cancer, metastatic to bone. Consider the following scenarios and questions. The patient's wife requests that the physician increase the rate of morphine infusion to a point adequate to control the patient's pain, irrespective of any effect it might have on his respiratory rate. Should the physician acquiesce? Or consider this. The patient's wife requests that the inevitable be hastened and that sufficient morphine be administered to end the patient's life and hence his suffering. Should the physician acquiesce in this instance? Well, here's what the analysis has to say. The principle of non-maleficence 
imposes a prima facie prohibition on the infliction of harm or risk thereof on this patient and increasing the amount of morphine the patient is receiving will expose the patient to an increased risk of respiratory depression and death. On the other hand, inadequate or suboptimal dosing of this patient's morphine will harm the patient as well by causing pain and suffering. What therefore should be done? Well, the answer lies in the RDE, or the rule of double effect, which recognizes that there is a morally relevant difference between the intended effects of an action and its unintended, though foreseen, effects. Under the RDE, when an action has two inextricably linked foreseen effects, one ethically permissible and the other ethically questionable, the permissible effect may be pursued even though the questionable or harmful one will follow, provided that all of the following conditions are met. One, the act must be good, or at least morally neutral. Two, the agent intends only the good effect, that is, the bad effect can be foreseen, tolerated, and permitted, but it's not intended. Three, the bad effect must not be a means to the good effect. If the good effect were the direct causal result of the bad effect, the agent would intend the bad effect in pursuit of the good effect, so that wouldn't be allowed. And four, the good effect must outweigh the bad effect. That is, the bad effect is permissible only if a proportionate reason compensates for permitting the foreseen bad effect. Thus, in this case, morphine indeed has two inextricably linked effects, one ethically permissible, analgesia, and the other ethically problematic, respiratory depression. The act in question, this administration of a pharmaceutical drug, is arguably at least a morally neutral act, satisfying condition one. Condition two is satisfied in scenario one if the physician titrates the morphine drip only as high as is needed to achieve adequate analgesia. Likewise, condition three is satisfied in scenario one because respiratory depression is not the means to this. Finally, condition four is satisfied in scenario one because most people would agree that achieving adequate pain control at the end of, of a life of terminal cancer is worth any foreseeable shortening of the patient's life that might occur as a result of the narcotic administration. Therefore, in scenario one, the RDE applies and the physician's acquiescence does not violate the principle of non-maleficence. So, to summarize, in the first scenario, the patient's wife wants the physician to increase the morphine, morphine drip to adequately control the patient's pain, even though it might have a negative effect on his respiratory rate. Doing this would be ethically permissible because she's not intending to make his breathing more difficult. She's intending to help him with his pain. And that this is a good thing, especially for somebody at the end of life. But in scenario two, condition two is not satisfied because the physician intends the bad effect. Likewise, in scenario two, the bad effect becomes the means to the good effect. Thus, a physician who acquiesced under scenario two, where the wife requests that the inevitable be hastened and morphine be administered until the patient dies, that if the physician acquiesced in this situation, that would violate the principle of non-maleficence. So, when we're looking at acting with an eye towards this principle, we can allow certain bad consequences, but that needs to follow certain rules. The four rules laid out in this chapter that we looked at previously in another module need to be followed. Thus, to summarize, in general, we want to refrain from causing a patient harm, but 
harming a patient may be justifiable. If it's not intended, if it serves their interest, if the bad consequence is not a means to a good consequence, and perhaps if the benefit produced outweighs the harm. To summarize this lecture then, biomedical ethics today is undergirded by four principles. We looked at two of them, autonomy and non-maleficence. In healthcare settings, in the practice of medicine, we want to make sure that we are respecting patient autonomy and that we are trying to refrain from causing them harm. Of course, there are going to be exceptions to this. Maybe we'll look at those in some more cases as we go through this and the next few modules. Thank you all for listening. I hope you found this interesting. I'm looking forward to what y'all have to say in the discussion post. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.